Order. Allow the minister to remove his mask. We now come to the next statement, and I call Minister Nadim Zahawi. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. With permission, I would like to uh, uh, make a statement on the COVID-19 vaccine delivery plan. Uh, the plan published today uh, sets out the strategies that underpin the development, manufacture and deployment of our vaccines against COVID-19. It represents, Madam Deputy Speaker, a staging post in our national mission to vaccinate against the coronavirus and a culmination of many months of hard work from the NHS, our armed forces, Public Health England and every level of local government in our union. There are many miles to go on this journey, Madam Deputy Speaker, but armed with this plan, our direction of travel is clear. And we should be buoyed by the progress uh, we're already making. As of today, Madam Deputy Speaker, in England, 2.33 million vaccinations have been given with 1.96 million receiving their first dose and 374,613 having already received both doses. We're on track to deliver our commitment of offering a first vaccine to everyone in the most vulnerable groups by the middle of next month. Groups, it is worth reminding ourselves, Madam Deputy Speaker, that account for more than four out of every five fatalities from the COVID virus, or some 88% of deaths. But of course, this is a delivery plan for everyone, a plan that will see us vaccinate all adults by the autumn in what is the largest programme of vaccination of its kind in British history. Madam Deputy Speaker, the UK Vaccines Delivery Plan sets out how we can achieve that noble and necessary and urgent goal. The plan rests on four key pillars. Supply, prioritisation, places and people. Turning to supply, our approach to uh, vaccines has been to move fast and move early. We had already been heavily investing in the development of new vaccines since 2016, including funding a vaccine against another coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. At the start of this year, this technology was rapidly repurposed to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. And in April, we provided £20 million of further funding so that the Oxford clinical trials could commence immediately. Today, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are the first country to buy, authorise and use that vaccine. Also in April, we established the UK Government's Vaccine Task Force, or VTF for short. And since then, they have worked relentlessly to build a wide portfolio of different types of vaccine signing early deals with the most promising prospects. It's a strategy that has really paid off. As of today, we've secured access to 367 million doses from seven vaccine developers with four different vaccine types, including the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which we were also the first in the world to buy, authorise and use. The VTF has also worked on our homegrown manufacturing capability, including what is referred to as fill and finish process in collaboration with Walkhart in Wrexham. Anticipating a potential global shortage early on, we reserve manufacturing capacity to allow for the supply of multiple vaccines to the United Kingdom. Like many capabilities in this pandemic, it's one we've never had before, but one we can draw on today. So much of that critical work undertaken early, Madam Deputy Speaker, has placed us in a strong position for the weeks and months ahead. The second pillar of our plan is prioritisation. 
as I set out earlier, essential work to protect those of the greatest clinical risk is already well underway. Because the basic principle that sits behind all of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, is to save as many lives as possible, as quickly as possible. In addition, we're working at speed to protect staff in our health and social care system. All four UK Chief Medical Officers agree with the recommendation of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JCVI, to prioritise the first doses for as many people on the priority list as possible and administer, administer second doses towards the end of the recommended vaccine dosing schedule of 12 weeks. This step will ensure the protection of the greatest number of at-risk people in the shortest possible time. Madam Deputy Speaker, the third pillar of our plan is places. As of yesterday, across the United Kingdom, we have over 2,700 vaccination sites up and running. There are three types of sites. The first, large vaccination centres that use big venues like football stadia, and you saw many of those launch today. At these, people will be able to get appointments using our national booking service. The second type is our hospital hubs working with NHS Trust across the country. And the third is our local vaccination services, and they are made up of sites led by GPs working in partnership with primary care trusts and, importantly, community pharmacies. This mix of different types of site offers the flexibility we need to reach many different and diverse groups and, importantly, be able to target as accurately as we can. By the end of January, everyone will be within 10 miles of a vaccination site. And in a small number of highly rural areas, Madam Deputy Speaker, the vaccination centre will be a mobile unit. It bears repeating, Madam Deputy Speaker, that when it is their turn, we want as many people as possible to take up the offer of a vaccine against COVID-19. The fourth and final pillar is, of course, our people. I'm grateful to the many thousands who've joined this mission, this national mission. We now have a workforce of some 80,000 people ready to be deployed across the country. This includes, of course, staff currently working within the NHS, but also includes volunteers through the NHS Bring Back scheme, such as St John's Ambulance, independent nurses and occupational health service providers. And there are similar schemes across the devolved administrations, as well as trained vaccinators, non-clinical support staff such as stewards, first aiders, administrators and logistics support will play their part. Moreover, we're drawing on the expertise of our UK armed forces, whose operational techniques we heard Brigadier Phil Prosser uh, bring to life at the press conference a few days ago with the Prime Minister have been tried and tested in some of the toughest conditions imaginable. I'm sure the whole House will join me in thanking everyone who's played their part in getting us to this point, as well as all those who will play an important role in the weeks and months ahead. Madam Deputy Speaker, we recognise that transparency about our vaccine plan will be central to maintaining public trust. And we are committed to publishing clear and simple updates. Since the 24th of December, we have published weekly UK-wide data on the total number of vaccinations and the breakdown between over and under 80s for England. From today, we are publishing daily data for England, showing the total number vaccinated to date. And the first daily publication was this afternoon. And from Thursday, and then on a weekly basis, NHS England will publish a more detailed breakdown of vaccinations in England, including by region. Madam Deputy Speaker, this continues to be a difficult time for our country, for our NHS, and for everyone as we continue to live under tough restrictions. But we've always known that a vaccine would be our best way out of this evil pandemic. 
And that is the road we are now taking. We are under no illusion as to the scale of the challenge ahead, the distance still yet to travel. In more normal times, Madam Deputy Speaker, the largest vaccination programme in British history would be an epic feat. But against the back backdrop of a global pandemic and a new, more transmissible variant, it is a huge challenge. Yet, with this House, and indeed with the whole nation behind this national mission, I have every confidence that it will be a national success. And I commend the statement to the House. Thank you. Alex Norris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'm grateful to the Minister for advice, advance sight of his statement. Now, we meet today at a very challenging moment in handling this pandemic. Uh, we have growing infection rates, we're in lockdown, businesses are shuttered, schools are closed, and tragically, more than 80,000 people have already lost their lives to the, this awful virus. And the vaccine provides us with that light, that glimmer of hope, and provides us with a way to beat the virus, saving lives and getting us back to normal. Uh, the government has succeeded with the development of, of a vaccine. Uh, investing in multiple candidates has paid off handsomely, uh, but a vaccine alone does not make a vaccination programme. And given the government's failures with the test and trace system and on the procurement of PPE, it is right that we scrutinise these plans carefully. Now, the plan itself is quite a conventional plan. Aside from the new big vaccination centres, it uses traditional delivery mechanisms operating within traditional opening times and, and access. As an opposition, we do have some concerns with this. Uh, we believe ex exceptional circumstances call for an exceptional response. 24-7 uh, access, I know earlier today at uh, the, the number 10 briefing that this was, this was said to be something that people wouldn't be interested in. I'm, I was very surprised to hear that. I'd be interested to, to hear from the Minister his basis for that. But similarly, the mass deployment of community spaces and also a need for a volunteer mobilisation unprecedented in peacetime. Now, it's the government's prerogative to choose their approach, but I'd be keen to hear from the Minister assurance that this plan, as written, as constituted today, will deliver on what's been promised, those top four priority categories covered by the middle of next month. Um, on a recent call, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Minister said that the only limiting factor on uh, the immunisation programme would be the speed of supply. Will he publicly reaffirm that and confirm that this plan will make maximum use of the supply as he expects to get it? Now, I think we would all agree that our frontline NHS and social care heroes deserve to be protected. At the beginning of this pandemic, our staff for too long were left without adequate PPE, and we must not repeat this with the vaccine. Protecting them is the right thing to do to reflect the risks that they face, but also it's pragmatically uh, a point of emphasis for us because we need them to be well in order to keep doing the incredible job that they're doing. We're currently missing about 46,000 NHS staff for COVID reasons. Um, the health and social care workforce are category two in this plan, but there does not seem to be national level emphasis on inoculating them immediately, and there seems to be significant variation from trust area to trust area. Will the Minister today commit today to, to meet our demand that they all get their vaccines within the next fortnight? Uh, and he talked, and we very much welcome the, the clear and simple metrics that he's going to publish each day so we can follow the success of the programme. But will he commit as part of that to publicising the daily total of health and care staff vaccinated so we can see the progress made against vi that vital metric too? It was re very much reassuring, Madam Deputy Speaker, to see pharmacy included in this plan. They are at the heart of all of the communities in our country. Uh, they're trusted. They already deliver mass vaccinations. It was disappointing and surprising to see them have to take to the front page of national newspapers last week to get the government's attention. But now with them in the plan, will the Minister reassure the House that he's now fully engaged with their representative bodies and that they are satisfied that they're being used properly? Uh, the number trailed publicly is, is of 200 participating pharmacies. Given that there are 11,500 community pharmacies in England, can that really be right? Uh, are, why aren't there more involved, or is that number wrong? And if so, could the Minister perhaps share with us uh, the, what that number is? Uh, on social care, 23% of elderly care home residents have been vaccinated, and that compares to 40% of the over 80s more generally. Given their top prioritisation, is there a reason for this lag, and what plans are there to close this gap? And is the Minister confident that all care home residents will be vaccinated by the end of the month as promised? 
And then finally, on misinformation, this is something that's been, uh, I think there's a high level of consensus across this place, certainly between the Minister and I on this, and we will support the Government in whatever ways they think they need to do to tackle misinformation. But we'll have a very real sense of the impacts of misinformation as this programme rolls along, particularly uh, as we look at who, say, who is and, and isn't declining the vaccine. So I wonder if, if the Minister might uh, tell us what he'll be monitoring there and what the early uh, feedback is, perhaps from our own care staff. Uh, as to who's been saying yes and who's been saying no and what that might mean for the future. Madam Deputy Speaker, we welcome that the Government have published this plan. We'll back them when we think they're right, but we'll continue to offer constructive ways to improve the process, as I hope I've just done, and I hope the Minister can address the points that I've raised. Thank you. I'm grateful uh, uh, for the Honourable Member's um, uh, backing and support, and he asks a number of, of important questions. I'll attempt to answer them uh, uh, now for him. Uh, suffice to say, uh, it would be, I think, um, sensible uh, for us to recognise that Test and Trace uh, now actually uh, delivers 85% uh, of those who are tested positive uh, in terms of uh, identifying their direct contacts and, of course, the indirect contacts are between 92 and 96%. Um, I think five million, over 5 million people uh, have been tested and isolated and therefore not uh, transmitting, not spreading this uh, virus. 55 million people have been uh, tested. It is a pretty uh, uh, major undertaking with capacity of touching 770,000 now uh, and tests running at uh, about 600,000 a day. Uh, from a standing start, Madam Deputy Speaker, about 2,000 a day back in March. It's a pretty remarkable achievement for NHS test and trace. Uh, on his 24-hour um, uh, question, so there are, there are two priorities for the NHS, and we've looked really long and hard at this. Uh, priority number one is obviously to target very, very uh, uh, closely those four most vulnerable categories. The priority two is to try and get a vaccination to them as quickly as possible, so throughput. Uh, and this is linked both in terms of, you know, if you go to a 24-hour um, uh, uh, regime, much harder uh, for you to actually just target the vaccine at those four cohorts, because obviously when you have limited vaccine volume, um, if it's 24 hours open, you don't want people standing around or waiting uh, for those people. Plus, many of these people obviously are over 80. Uh, residents of care homes, we're going into care homes for them. And so the decision to go eight to eight is because we want to make sure there is even spread and targeting very closely. Now, that's also linked to throughput, i.e., how many um, vaccinations can you get into people's arms as quickly as possible? You don't want them sitting in fridges or on shelves. And that actually goes to his question on both the 24 hours, but also on the pharmacy question. Now, the pharmacies that we are operationalizing, the 200, all of them can do 1,000 plus vaccinations a week. So the focus in phase one, and certainly in the first four categories, and I think for the, uh, the balance, the other, uh, uh, the total nine categories, is very much on targeting and throughput, so that the uh, sites, the 2,700 sites, are the best way that we can target that through, obviously, primary care is very good at identifying uh, those who are most vulnerable or over 80, and of course, getting into care homes, hence why uh, the NHS plan and the plan that we've published today it is very much based around those priorities. Now, as we enter phase two, uh, where you begin to want to vaccinate as many adults as quickly as possible um, in the country, then you want convenience, of course. You want to be able to go into many, many more pharmacies so that you can actually walk to your local pharmacy or your uh, GP and get your jab uh, when you have limitless volumes of vaccines, as we have uh, clearly now uh, got optioned and will come through uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And so that's the, the uh, reason around that. And you, he's absolutely right. The limiting factor continues to be, at this stage, vaccine volumes. The NHS has built an infrastructure that can deploy uh, the vaccine as quickly as possible, uh, but it is vaccine volumes now, that will change because with any new manufacturing process, um, especially one where you're dealing with a, quite a complex process, this is a biological compound uh, that you're producing, it tends to be lumpy at the start,
but it very quickly stabilizes and uh, becomes much more even, and we're beginning uh, uh, to see that, which is actually uh, uh, good news. In terms of health and social care, workforce absolutely committed to making sure that they are uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible, and of course, uh, the residents of care homes, we're committed to making sure they are vaccinated by the end of this month, January, uh, and I, I reaffirm that commitment uh, to him. Um, I think his final question was on data, and I'm uh, glad he agrees that it's important because the Prime Minister's absolute uh, uh, instruction uh, to us as a team is we have to make sure we publish as much data as possible, as quickly as possible, hence why we've moved to a, to a uh, rhythm of daily uh, data, and, daily, and then the Thursday more detailed publication, um, uh, which will have regional breakdowns, and the NHS is committed as they build up more data for them to publish more and more. So people, the nation expects, and the nation quite rightly wants to see uh, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the speed and the targeting that we are delivering. Uh, but I'm confident that uh, the NHS has a, a, a solid plan, that we have the volunteers, we have the army, two great institutions in this country delivering this campaign. And with the support of Her Majesty's opposition, I'm sure we will do this. Well, we go to the Chairman of the Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate the Minister for getting this programme off to a flying start to vaccinate two million people, including a third of over 80s, just six weeks after the first dose was approved is an extraordinary achievement unmatched by any similar country. Can I ask you about the speed of the rollout? Many people want teachers to be jabbed as quickly as possible, but is it the case that all those in groups one to four will need their second jabs before we can make real inroads into other key groups? And will he publish not just the breakdown of numbers vaccinated by region, but by local authority area? Because I think a lot of people would like to know just how many people have been vaccinated in their local area. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'm grateful um, uh, for uh, my honourable friend's compliment. And uh, this is uh, uh, only the start. Uh, and I hope that uh, uh, as we progress in the weeks and months to come, uh, we will continue. Uh, uh, at the, 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 the sort of focus and the rate of, of output uh, will continue uh, to rise. Uh, I think he raises an important point uh, around the uh, critical workforce uh, for the economy, uh, like teachers. So the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation looked at all uh, these issues and have come out very clearly uh, on the, in favour of us uh, vaccinating the nine uh, cohorts that are most vulnerable to dying from COVID-19, uh, hence why that is absolutely our focus. Um, we are absolutely committed to making sure that people get two doses. So if you've received your Pfizer first dose, you will get your Pfizer second dose within 12 weeks of the first dose. Similarly, if you've had your AstraZeneca first dose, you will get your uh, AstraZeneca second dose within 12 weeks. So those people that we will begin to uh, reach in March, where we have to deliver their second dose, they will absolutely get their second dose. Um, but to his point, the more vaccine volumes that will come, and we have uh, tens of millions uh, uh, that will come through beyond uh, February uh, and into uh, uh, March, uh, the, the faster we can begin to protect those nine categories in phase one. But the moment we've done that, uh, then it's absolutely right. We should begin to look at uh, the you know, categories like teachers, police officers, those who may be exposed uh, 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 in, their, in their workplace to uh, the uh, risks of this virus. Of course, it's worth reminding the House that it is two weeks after the first dose and three weeks after the first dose with, uh, with AstraZeneca that you begin to get that protection, not the moment you are jabbed. So there is that lag time as well. But his point is well made that we need to make sure as we protect greater and greater numbers of people in those nine categories, we then move very quickly to the next dose. And now we go to Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. 
The Joint Committee on Vaccination was very clear that those who live in care homes were the top priority for vaccination against COVID-19. Due to integration of health and social care, Scottish health boards were able to deliver the Pfizer vaccine into care homes in December and well over 70% of such residents have already been vaccinated across Scotland. In my own health board, the phase is almost complete. So can the, sec the minister explain why in England, care home residents were not the first cohort to receive the Pfizer vaccine in December? And as only a quarter have received their first dose, when does he expect all such residents to have been vaccinated? People over 80 years are now being offered vaccination, but there are only 1,200 sites to cover the whole of England, a similar number to Scotland, which has less than 10% of the population. This means elderly people are being asked to travel long distances, despite their age and the fact that many will be also shielding. As the letter doesn't offer the option to wait and have their vaccine at a local GP surgery, does he recognise that many are now feeling pressurised into travelling despite the current dangers? So will he take this opportunity to clarify that the vaccines will gradually be made available through all GP surgeries and that elderly patients who can't travel long distances will be offered a further opportunity closer to home? He will be well aware of the public concern about the decision to delay the second dose of each vaccine so as to ensure more people receive the first dose more quickly. With the current surge in COVID cases, I totally understand the rationale for this approach. So can you explain why there have been more than 300,000 additional second doses given over the last week, despite the JCVI announcement on the 31st of December? And can he guarantee that sufficient quantities of the Pfizer vaccine will be available by the end of February to ensure those given their first dose in early December will receive their booster on time. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot there to unpack. Let me try and take it in reverse. We can guarantee that those who've had their Pfizer vaccine will get their booster within the prescribed up to 12 weeks. Uh, the uh, question she asks about uh, those who've had a second jab already. The uh, uh, information went out to primary care networks and to hospital hubs uh, that those uh, who have an appointment up to the 4th of January should be able to have their appointment honoured. Beyond that, they've been working very closely with the NHS England team centrally, where we've been supporting them both with resources and actually phoning to postpone those appointments uh, further, hence why we protect many more people. It's worth reminding the House that for every 250 people from the first, uh, 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 the most vulnerable cohorts that we protect, we save a life. For every 20 people in care home that we vaccinate, we save a life. Uh, and hence the focus very much now is on care homes. We began with the Pfizer vaccine into care homes. And of course, last week on the 4th of January, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, much easier to administer, especially for the roving teams into care homes, had to spend two days in hospitals before the, it was released to primary care networks. But the moment it was, it went into care homes. Now, some areas in England, and we have about 10,000 care homes that we have to vaccinate the residents and, of course, those who look after them, have done uh, their care homes already. Others are beginning to do the same thing. All will be done by the end of the month. Um, she talked about uh, people having to... Uh, travel long distances. I mentioned in my opening statement of the strategy there, will be, there are 2,700 sites vaccinating. Uh, I think she may have been confused around the 1,200, which is the primary care networks and hospital hubs and large vaccination centres. Um, but there are 2,700 uh, sites. Uh, no one will be more than 10 miles away from a vaccination site by the end of the month. I thank the Minister for being so assiduous in giving very thorough answers uh, to the, the long and complicated series of questions that have already been put to him. But I must say to the House that we now have half an hour more for the rest of this statement. 
and so I insist upon having questions and not statements from everyone and I specifically mention this to people who are coming in virtually because they seem to lose a sense of timing when they're not here in the chamber. A question means a question, just one question and I say to the Minister who has been most assiduous that where the, he has already given an answer to the question I won't insist that he has to give the answer again because the person who is now asking it hasn't listened to his first answer. Bob Stewart. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, some of my Beckenham constituents have contacted me, constituents have contacted me, saying they think they should have had the vaccination already. Two of them are in their 90s, and I, I'm slightly alarmed by that. So um, I'm told GPs aren't necessarily the people you go to to ask what's happening. Um, so I wonder who my constituents and I should go to when we inadvertently, the system inadvertently perhaps, doesn't actually give out an appointment which it might have done. I'm grateful uh, to my honourable friend for his question. Uh, for his constituents, they will be contacted either by their primary care uh, network or by, the, uh, 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 by letter for the uh, National uh, Booking Service. Uh, they don't have to um, uh, go to the um, vaccination, national vaccination centres uh, if that's inconvenient. They will be able to get their vaccination uh, through the primary care uh, network or uh, through the hospital hubs as well. Um, very happy to uh, take uh, that particular two cases offline and look into them and give them more detail. Monira Wilson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to just dig in a bit deeper into the supply question. I uh, had the privilege of visiting a GP surgery in my constituency on Friday where I was told by the doctor in charge they can't book the next set of appointments because they don't know when they get the next delivery of vaccine. I've heard from other centres that they're not allowed to move on to the next cohort when they finish their under 80s because of making sure there's equity across the country. And the Minister has said we can't have 24-7 vaccination because of supply. So is it the rate at which the product is being manufactured? Is it the rate at which it's being packaged? Is it the uh, rate at which it's being batch tested? Or is it the rate at which it's being distributed around the country that's the supply issue? Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, the Honourable Lady asks an important question. So, in any manufacturing, um, uh, and especially a new manufacturing process, uh, it, it is always uh, lumpier at the beginning. There are more challenges. There are a number of um, uh, uh, tests that both the manufacturer and, of course, the regulator. So, the batch testing at the end of the process done by the regulator to make sure that the batches actually meet the very high standards that we have in the United Kingdom. Uh, but of course, that will begin to become much smoother, stabilise, and we have good, clear line of sight uh, through to end of February, hence why we're confident that we can meet the targets of uh, uh, offering a vaccine to the, to the most vulnerable top four cohorts on the list of nine from the JCVI uh, by middle of February. Uh, I think it's important uh, for her uh, local GPs, one, to obviously thank them, but also uh, to remember that the central team, uh, which is doing the distribution, at the moment we're running at about 98.5% accuracy. It does mean we've got 1.5% where the deliveries are not uh, as we would like them to be. We will get better at that. As uh, Brigadier Prosser said, this is like uh, standing up a supermarket chain in a month, Madam Deputy Speaker, and then growing it by 20% uh, every couple of weeks. So um, it will get better. The focus of the central team is to try and give as much um, time and notice for pri primary care networks, for GPs like her own, so they can plan ahead and be able to you know, get those uh, cohorts, the four, four cohorts, in for their appointments, for their jab. Uh, always difficult at the outset, but it gets better by the day and as we, in, in the weeks ahead as well. Mark Pritchard. Madam Deputy Speaker, would the Minister like to join me in thanking NHS staff in Telford and Rekin and Shropshire for having vaccinated over 15,000 people already? But perhaps he could also reassure my constituents who have received a letter from NHS England inviting them to have a vaccination in Birmingham or even Manchester, an hour and 45 minutes away, that if they wait just a few more days, they can choose, if they wish, 
to have a vaccination, very local indeed. I'm grateful for my right honourable friend. I, I will absolutely join him in congratulating and thanking uh, the heroes uh, of the NHS and the volunteers in Telford, Oregon and Shropshire for their 15,000 uh, people that they've vaccinated. 15,000 people in a couple of weeks' time will have that protection. The most vulnerable to uh, COVID will have that uh, protection. He's absolutely right, and I would confirm to the House that anyone receiving a letter where it is uh, inappropriate or unable for them uh, to travel that distance to a uh, national vaccination centre. They don't have to. Uh, they'll be able to vaccinate in their primary care network um, uh, at a time and a place that, that is convenient uh, to them. What we've tried to do uh, with the national vaccination centres, seven went live today, more next week, more the week after, 50 in total uh, uh, by the end of the month, um, is to try and uh, effectively add to the throughput that I described earlier. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Good news, if I could say. My mother, who is 89 years young, had her vaccine this morning at 9.40 a.m. So, really happy day, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was going to sing it, but then it would start to rain, so it's not a good idea. Uh, could I ask the Minister what system is in place that if someone does not turn up for their vaccine, but not one slot or vaccine is go goes to waste, and there is a secondary list immediately available with the, with the staff to substitute? And Northern Ireland over the weekend at the Dundonald Hospital. They had some people who didn't turn up, but they were able to call upon the midwife's team to come forward. So, what policy is in place to make sure that the vaccine is not lost for use? Thank you. I'm grateful for the member for Strangford, and the people of Strangford will be uh, pleased to hear that his uh, mother has actually got her first uh, 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 dose of the uh, vaccine. Uh, so, uh, it really is important, and this is an important message to send to the whole country that if you are called up, and you have an appointment for the vaccine, please turn up to the vaccine. You know, this vaccine can protect your life. Uh, it can protect somebody else's life. And it, it, it's a shame that, that you don't turn up uh, if you book an appointment. What the NHS in England uh, have done is to make sure that hospital hubs and primary care networks that have been vaccinating, and now obviously the uh, national vaccination centres, is have, um, how can I describe it, on speed dial, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, their uh, care home uh, 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 workers uh, and those on the front line um, of this battle against COVID who are in the top four uh, cohorts, the categories from the JCVI, to get them in as quickly as possible so not a single dose is wasted. Thank you. Maria Miller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I thank my honourable friend for his incredible tenacity on this such important project. Our local vaccine centre in Basingstoke serves six primary care networks across Hampshire, and under his plan, 20,000 over 75 should receive their first vaccination at this hub from our army of volunteers and local NHS staff by the end of the next 35 days. Can my friend, honourable friend say how the large differences in patient numbers at each hub is factored in when vaccine supplies are dispatched. Can I reiterate the need for CCG level data to monitor progress? And can he more urgently reconsider the priority given to teachers, please? I'm grateful uh, to my honourable friend for her question. I think I've dealt with the question of teachers uh, earlier. Incredibly important. Uh, phase one is to focus on those who are most vulnerable to dying from this disease, and as soon as we're, we get through that, uh, phase two teachers and uh, other uh, frontline service, police officers and others, will be absolutely uppermost in our minds. Uh, and of course, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, who help us with the, that uh, prioritisation. Uh, she's absolutely right to, to raise the issue of uh, vaccine supply, and I know that her local vaccination service have done a, a tremendous job. There was a, 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 a slight uh, hiccup if I can describe it as that, in terms of making sure that they're recognised as, as six primary networks um, uh, in, in the system which we rectified. And I assure her uh, that uh, the volumes that uh, I certainly have line of sight will mean that they will receive plenty of vaccine to hit that target by mid-February of vaccinating, offering the top four cohorts the opportunity of the vaccine. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As of Friday, the staff in care homes in Walthamstow that serve a smaller community, so those with fewer than 20 beds, tell me that not a single patient has had the vaccine or an invitation to get the vaccine. 
the minister will be aware that these residents are very aware that they were promised the vaccine originally would come to them by the end of December. They feel like they are sitting ducks. With less than three weeks of January left, will the minister pledge that all of these residents in the smaller care homes will at least get an invitation so they know when they will get the vaccine within the next week? Grateful for the Honourable Lady's question. I, um, I think uh, uh, shared the statistic with the House earlier that for every 20 residents of care homes that we vaccinate, we save life. They are absolutely our priority. And uh, I give her this uh, 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 pledge that we will vaccinate all or offer to vaccinate all residents of care homes um, by the end of the month, 10,000 care homes in England. Now, some areas of the country have already vaccinated all of their care home residents. Uh, others are beginning to. We will make sure that residents of care homes by the end of this month will be offered the opportunity of a vaccine. David Johnston. I congratulate my honourable friend on the start of the vaccination programme. Local health leaders in Oxfordshire have made a great start too, but they report a worrying trend of those from ethnic minorities not taking up the vaccine at the same rate as other groups. Could my honourable friend set out his strategy to make sure that all our constituents take up this vital vaccine? I'm grateful for my honourable friend. Uh, information, information, information. Uh, I'm working uh, across... Uh, government to make sure that we communicate uh, the benefits, uh, both in terms of, of, of protecting uh, the individual, but also protecting the communities uh, uh, that, these, that people come from. Uh, and of course, working with uh, BAME communities is, is incredibly important as part of the overall strategy to focus uh, our attention to make sure all those communities come forward, especially those who work in our care homes, that, that, that care for the residents, uh, many of them from BAME communities. And the more that they see people like themselves taking the vaccine, getting protected, the, the, the more effective our strategy is to deliver that protection to those communities. Karen Buck. Following on very closely to that question, does the minister agree with me that one of the, uh, the key ways in which we're going to be countering some of the uh, very virulent anti-vax and indeed COVID denial messages that are out there on social media and that are impacting particularly uh, in, in some communities need to be countered not just by a myth-busting approach but by the peer-to-peer -peer positive example messaging within local communities, within faith groups, uh, uh, between neighbours in local uh, uh, media net social media networks. Can he uh, make sure that he advises local authorities and community cl clinical commissioning groups and others to promote examples of where people have had the vaccine so that these can be shared uh, in order to counter some of those uh, more damaging messages? The Honourable Lady makes a really important point, and uh, I want to uh, pay tribute to the member for Tottenham uh, as he reached out to me with his concerns for his community. And I also uh, sadly see it amongst uh, the community uh, that myself and my wife uh, come from, where there's uh, you know, a lot of uh, disinformation, not only on social media, but very clever and evil, I should say, uses of uh, you know, platforms like WhatsApp to share uh, uh, videos to scare people into not having uh, the vaccine. And she's absolutely right. Local government have a central role to play in this. Uh, local public health uh, leaders as well. We're engaging with them and, of course, making sure that uh, local leaders throughout the United Kingdom uh, are engaging and telling the story. And she's right to say the most effective way is people see someone like them actually taking the vaccine and being protected, and we're doing that as well. Heather Wheeler. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I thank my honourable friend for all his work in making sure the vaccine gets to all parts of the UK. Um, can I ask my friend to look particularly at how the rollout is being managed by the health services in South Derbyshire, as sadly compared to our neighbours in Erewash or Burton, so far only a very limited number have been called to a local site run by our GPs in conjunction with the clinical commissioning group. 
I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady, and uh, uh, she raises an important point, I, and I will commit to looking specifically uh, at uh, the point she raises. The NHS in England have done a, an incredible job, but of course um, uh, some teams have outperformed others, and we've got to learn from the best and make sure we share that knowledge. And if some of them need the additional resource and help, which is why we've got the additional 80,000 uh, people who are actually now part of the programme, ready to help, ready to make sure that we get those jabs into the most vulnerable people's arms, we will do that as well. Cat Smith. I'm Deputy Speaker. For parts of Lancashire, the closest mass vaccination centre is over 60 miles away in Manchester. The Minister has said that there will be more mass vaccination centres, so can he reassure my constituents that we will get a centre on the Fylde Coast and in North Lancashire? I'm grateful for the Honourable Lady. Uh, she's absolutely right uh, uh, to highlight the issue of distance. No one in her constituency or anywhere else in England will be more than 10 miles away from a vaccination site. Cheryl Murray. Speaker. Subsequent to the question from the Honourable Member for Beckenham, I too am starting to get queries about vaccinations from elderly residents at the moment, but I'm sure this will expand as the rollout progresses. People could be missed. What facilities is his department putting in place to help answer questions from very worried constituents quickly? I'm grateful for my honourable friend uh, for, her, for her question. Uh, she will know that I have engaged uh, with colleagues to, to, to really sort of dig deep into some of the issues their constituents and, uh, may have with the vaccination programme. Very happy to look at any cases that she may have. All I would say to her is uh, the combination of standing up hospitals, the primary care networks, uh, supported by uh, community pharmacies and now the national vaccination centres, all her residents within those four cohorts should be captured uh, by the primary care services who know their community really well. And if they're not, we're engaging heavily with local government because actually one of the real lessons of Test and Trace is to make sure we engage with local government because they know their residents really, really well. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Before the recent spending review, the SNP had called for an uplift in the NHS in England to bring per capita spending in line with Scotland and thus providing billions to support the rollout of this vaccine and build up capacity. The Treasury announced less than a third of what we had asked for. Does the Minister expect NHS England to be able to keep up with the vaccination demand despite this lack of investment? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the head of NHS England, uh, Simon Stevens, was before the, uh, uh, the uh, Public Affairs Committee uh, uh, today, uh, and uh, I'm sure the Honourable Lady will look at his uh, answers. Uh, suffice to say, the Chancellor has made £6 billion available. Uh, for uh, the NHS to, and the NHS family to make sure we deliver and deploy as fast as we can to the most vulnerable cohorts in our country. Rob Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The national rollout is undoubtedly extremely impressive, but unfortunately the benefits are not yet being felt in Aylesbury. Residents there are increasingly concerned that they've been left behind and it's been extraordinarily difficult for Buckinghamshire's MPs and council to get definite information about where and when vaccines will be available. So can my honourable friend confirm that there will start to be vaccines available in Aylesbury in days rather than weeks? I'm grateful for my honourable friend. Uh, absolutely, we have to make sure that uh, his residents are within 10 miles of a vaccination site as soon as, as, as the end of this month. Um, as early as possible to get vaccinating. He is a great champion of his constituents, and I'm happy to look at any specifics that he may have um, and take those um, offline and come back to him. Toby Parkins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The vaccination centre in Chesterfield, the largest town in Derbyshire, is only opening on Wednesday. It's clear from my recent conversations with Derbyshire Clinical Commissioning Group that we are not currently on target to hit the uh, all 
groups being, all vulnerable groups being done by the 15th of February and there is no centre at all in Staveley. So can the Minister tell us what will happen between now and the 15th of February to get from the position we're currently in to achieving the target that he's set that we also desperately want him to achieve? And can he make sure there is a centre in Staveley? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, it's great to see him looking fit and well, uh, and I wish him all the very best. Um, he's absolutely right to say that um, we've got to make sure every part of the country uh, meets that target uh, to make sure that we offer those four cohorts that uh, opportunity of a vaccine. Uh, we will, the reason we're looking to make sure we publish uh, more granular data, the regional data, is so that we can see uh, which areas are uh, you know, not keeping up uh, the pace and therefore can direct resources to them to make sure that they do, by mid-February, make that offer. James Davis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank my honourable friend for his statement and his hard work on vaccine deployment. Now, many of my Vale of Clwyd constituents have raised with me their concerns over the speed of rollout of vaccination in North Wales. So will my, right honourable, fr will my honourable friend confirm the quantity of vaccine delivered to Wales so far, and will he undertake to publish regular updates on the delivery of future batches so it can be clear where bottlenecks in the rollout are occurring? I'm grateful for my honourable friend's uh, question. We work very closely um, with the uh, Welsh, uh, Scottish and Northern Irish uh, governments on this programme. We uh, make sure that we deliver the vaccine volumes to them, uh, and I will reassure my honourable friend, although we don't publish exactly what the uh, quantities are for uh, um, a variety of reasons, including, of course, uh, the, the whole world is looking to get more volumes of vaccines at the moment, uh, and we don't want to disadvantage ourselves in any way commercially. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, but the devolved administration will all have uh, enough vaccine to be able to offer those four, ca four cohorts of the JCVI uh, by mid-February, the opportunity of being vaccinated and protected, at least for the first dose. Florence Echelomi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Teachers in Vauxhall are working tirelessly to manage the delivery of classrooms online, as well as teaching the most vulnerable key worker children right. in our schools. Now, the minister highlighted her earlier that he will prioritise those that are most likely to die yeah. and that he will teach, keep teachers at the forefront of his mind. Can I please ask the ministers why teachers and school staff who are on the front line of this pandemic aren't being protected and what is the timeline for getting them vaccinated? Grateful to the Honourable Lady, and I uh, uh, thank all the teachers in Vauxhall and the rest of the country for the work they're doing, uh, of course, on online education, but also on uh, teaching the children uh, of the most vulnerable families and the children of our NHS and social care staff on the front line as well. Um, she's absolutely right to highlight this issue. Now, some of the teachers will be captured in the nine cohorts that the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation have set out for us, if they are obviously clinically vulnerable, as an example, um, or in the right age group in terms of the one to nine uh, categories. Uh, but as soon as we are through phase one, absolutely the priority will be uh, to make sure that, that those who are critical uh, to the functioning of the future of our country, which is you know, the future generations uh, to come, are prioritised. And I give her that uh, commitment. Laura Ferris. I congratulate my honourable friend on his uh, excellent start. In Newbury, we are due to receive our first doses later this week, and the issue is one of information. All my constituents want to know is when the doses will be received and when their loved ones can expect to be contacted. Could I invite my honourable friend to work with NHS England to ensure that timely local information is made readily available going forwards? I'm grateful, Madam Speaker. I absolutely share uh, her concern, but also I give her this commitment because I know the team at NHS England are working and focusing on this to give as much um, uh, time and notice as possible to primary care, to hospitals, as to when they get the delivery so they can make those appointments and keep uh, vaccinating those who are most vulnerable. That's exactly their priority at the moment. Emily Wilbach. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, community pharmacies have never closed. They really have been some of our unsung heroes. 
The Shields Gazette, my local paper, have launched the Shot in the Arm campaign, and we want to know why the Minister won't allow all of these experienced and dedicated community pharmacies to deliver the vaccine. I'm grateful, Madam Speaker. I, 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 well, first of all, that is actually, um, with respect, inaccurate. Community pharmacies are already part of the primary care networks that are delivering the vaccines. I've also, in the strategy, made very clear that there will be 200 uh, community and independent pharmacies as part of the uh, vaccination programme in phase one, where we do need that volume, the throughput. Those community pharmacies that can do the 1,000 vaccinations a week are very much uh, part of that programme, and we thank them for that. But as we get to the next stage, where we have vaccines in limitless uh, uh, volumes, then it is about convenience and ramping up the number of community pharmacies that can actually also join in the fight against COVID. Craig Whitaker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I congratulate my right honourable friend on a remarkable start. I can confirm that in Calderdale, we've already vaccinated over 50% of over 80s. But I just wonder if I could just press him a little bit on communication uh, channels with patients and about the vaccination process. We see GP surgery giving out very little information. And of course, you've already heard about uh, the letters going out for the, for the larger hubs. But people just do not understand what the process is. And I just wonder whether my right honourable friend could work with GP surgeries and others so that the general population understands what process it is they're in. I'm grateful for my honourable friend who always asks very important practical questions. He's absolutely right to say that it has been challenging. Part of that challenge I think we've addressed uh, today is the, the, the amount of time, the notice that primary care networks, the GPs, um, have before they are notified of a delivery. That will only get better as we stabilise the, the, uh, uh, the deliveries into the, uh, uh, the warehouses and then be able to take them out into the primary care networks and hospitals. And of course I will work with primary care networks, with the whole of the NHS family to make sure we get our communications better and better. Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In Salford, we receive little or no notice that a delivery of the vaccine from government is due and some batches haven't turned up at all. So when they do arrive, we act quickly. It was therefore staggering when late last night, our CCG was instructed to cancel 924 pre-existing second dose Pfizer appointments with little time to book new appointments before the batch expires at midday on Wednesday. Will the Minister now allow local CCGs to plan and order their own vaccine batches? And can he assure those now elongating their second Pfizer dose that they will be 70 to 90 per cent protected for up to 12 weeks? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The, uh, I'll take our questions in reverse. The four uh, chief medical officers have looked at the uh, issue of, of the uh, up to 12 week dosing and all agree that it's the right thing. To do, I apologise to people of Salford for uh, that uh, cancellation, if that's what happened uh, yesterday. I think we, we've touched upon it, but part of the issue has been the lumpiness in the deliveries in the early days. That does um, uh, be, be, begin to become uh, much smoother, and the NHS central team with the Brigadier Prosser and the uh, 101 Logistics uh, uh, Brigade absolutely are focused on making sure we give as much notice as possible to primary care networks so they can plan ahead and that will only get better and better as we smooth out the delivery process from manufacturer into warehouse. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker. The local NHS are doing a fantastic job at rolling out the vaccine to priority groups in Burnley and Padio. But I've had some residents contact me confused about what process they need to follow. So could my right honourable friend just set out whether residents need to contact the National Booking Centre or whether they're better to wait for the GP to contact them? If, my honourable friend, if they receive a letter from the National Booking Centre and it is convenient for them uh, to take up that uh, appointment, then to call and to, to make an appointment and get their vaccination done through the National Booking Centre. If it is inconvenient, then absolutely they can wait and the primary care network will contact them and give them an appointment to make sure that they're vaccinated because our absolute pleasure is to make sure that the four categories that are most vulnerable to coronavirus are offered a vaccine by mid-February. Alan Brown. 
Madam Deputy Speaker. In Scotland, care home residents have been tackled quicker than in England. Overall coverage in Scotland, similar to England, and pro rata, Scotland's got way more vaccination sites. But yet, the Duchy of Lancaster caused concern by stating that the Scottish Government are somehow sitting in supplies, and they did that by comparing coverage to actual allocation. So as we tackle fake news, does the Minister agree it's irresponsible to politic with fudge figures on such an important subject? I'm grateful for the Honourable Member's question. Uh, I think um, uh, Scottish care homes are, uh, uh, tend to be uh, uh, much larger in profile uh, than the 10,000 homes in England. We are very much focused on making sure that we vaccinate all care home residents by the end of January. We are working uh, with the four uh, uh, CMOs working very closely together to make sure that particular cohort, as I mentioned earlier, if we protect 20 residents, we save a life, is what we do. Christian Wakeford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we should rightfully be proud of the huge national effort to, uh, taking place to vaccinate the British people against COVID. We have seen the incredible speed and efficiency of Israel's vaccination drive, which is on track to vaccinate all over 16s by the end of March. So what discussions has my honourable friend had with his, his Israeli counterpart on replicating Israel's success, particularly in the areas of digitisation and accessibility? Yeah. For my honourable friend, um, uh, I commend the Israeli government and the Israeli health service for a, a stellar uh, job in vaccinating uh, their most vulnerable communities. And we have a lot to learn uh, from other countries, uh, including the throughput, the speed at which they manage to vaccinate. It's something that uh, uh, we can all uh, uh, learn from and, and improve our output as well. Uh, I have to say that NHS England and the teams on the front line have been doing a tremendous job, and it's just worth all of us uh, just thinking about that. We stand on the shoulders of real heroes. Um, we are way over time, so I'm only going to take four more questions, which I would be grateful if they could be swift. Jeremy Wright. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I congratulate my honourable friend for the progress made so far, but ask him for some reassurance about those whose appointments have been cancelled due to the vaccine unexpectedly not being available. Can he confirm they won't be forgotten about, they won't lose their place in the queue, and they will be reached swiftly? Minister. I'm grateful for my right honourable friend. As a question, he is absolutely right. Uh, the reassurance I can give him is that anyone who's had their appointment cancelled um, will uh, get that appointment reinstated and will get their vaccine. Our absolute commitment is to make sure that those four cohorts of the most vulnerable uh, have the offer of vaccine by middle of February. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I heard the Minister's earlier comments about vaccinations for teachers and school support staff, but can I ask uh, about the position in relation to special schools? Should their staff who work with profoundly disabled young people, including those with serious neuro disabilities and are providing personal and intimate care, not be treated in the same way as frontline social care workers? I'm grateful uh, for the Honourable Lady's question. She's absolutely right to highlight uh, uh, that particular cohort, which uh, some will be picked up in uh, category, category four, uh, some will be picked up in category six, including the people who look after them. Stephen Metcalf. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, vaccinating those in care homes will ensure some of the society's most vulnerable are protected against this awful virus. However, there are many who receive care at home. Does my right honourable friend agree that these people should be treated in the same way as care homes, as they have no option but to interact with many different people? I'm grateful for my honourable friend, absolutely right. And it's something that the primary care networks are best suited to make sure they, they actually focus on and deliver that uh, uh, vaccination that will protect those people who are most vulnerable to uh, dying from COVID-19. And finally, John Speller. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And all credit and our great thanks to the Vaccine Task Force and also our scientists who've been brilliant in developing the vaccine. But often in our history, it's been production engineering that's let us down. So can we have some figures? How many doses are produced each day? And what is our manufacturing capacity? Are there any holdups or capacity problems in testing the batches? How many doses are being filled in the vials each day? And again, what is the maximum capacity? 
I am grateful uh, for the Right Honourable Member's question. Uh, it is not our capacity, it is the manufacturers. AstraZeneca uh, produced the Oxford uh, vaccine, and of course Pfizer, BioNTech produced uh, uh, their vaccine, and Moderna now is also approved uh, in the process. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, there are a number of processes uh, throughout the manufacturing process. So when you go from uh, the bulk vaccine into fill and finish, there's, there's, there's a period of time, a sterility test that the vaccines have to go through, and then, of course, batch testing by both the manufacturer and the regulator. All of that gets you know, better and better every single day. It is a new manufacturing process. Both manufacturers, uh, one, AstraZeneca, Oxford are, are delivering 100 million vaccines. That's what we have bought from them. 40 million from Pfizer. We will have millions of vaccines in the next weeks and months to come, and we will meet our target of mid-February delivering the opportunity of a vaccine to the four cohorts that are most vulnerable to COVID. I thank the Minister, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry to the nine colleagues who have not been called to ask their questions. I hope they will encourage their colleagues to ask shorter questions in future, because that's how we'll manage to be fairer in getting more people in. I thank the Minister very much. Point of order. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster at the weekend in a television interview indicated that the problems at our ports are going to get worse before they get better. The protocol that we in this party warned about repeatedly and consistently since its inception has caused problems with food supplies not reaching supermarket shelves in Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Uh, if the problems are going to get worse, and hauliers have indicated that they are going to get worse over the next few days, has the Chancellor indicated his intention to come before the House to spell out what he intends to do to either invoke Article 16 or to, to, to take decisive action that will ensure the seamless and unfettered distribution of food from GP? GB to the shelves of supermarkets in Northern Ireland. Well, I thank the honourable gentleman uh, for his point and for having given me notice of his intention to raise this matter. The, the direct answer to his question, as far as the chair is concerned, is that Mr. Speaker has not been given any notice of any intention uh, of the minister to uh, make a statement um, tomorrow. Although there are, of course other ways in which the Honourable Gentleman can try to require the presence of the Minister here in the Chamber to answer his point. Um, under these unusual arrangements, I will take a point of order from Hilary Benn. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. On a point of order, the Committee on the Future Relationship with the European Union will cease to exist in five days' time. I wrote to the Leader of the House on the 10th of December to ask for more time to allow us to complete our work so that we could scrutinise the trade and cooperation agreement that was eventually reached with the EU on Christmas Eve. The Leader replied on the 6th of January to decline the request. I then wrote to him the following day to ask him to reconsider in the light of the fact that having asked Lord Frost and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to give evidence to the Select Committee on the agreement, neither of them is available this week. This means that the committee that was set up specifically to examine matters relating to the negotiations on the future relationship with the European Union will now be prevented from taking evidence from the person who negotiated the agreement and from reporting fully to the House on its implications. As this is, to put it mildly, highly unsatisfactory, has the Leader of the House given any indication to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that he intends to change his mind to move us to standing order accordingly so we can take evidence from Lord Frost and uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster? I thank the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. Uh, in answer to his specific question, I can confirm he will be disappointed to know that Mr Speaker has not had any representation such as he describes from the Leader of the House uh, on that matter. I can understand the Right Honourable Gentleman's consternation 
uh, at the situation as regards the committee uh, which he chaired. The fact is that the order establishing the committee on the 16th of January last year had effect for 12 months and therefore in the absence of any further decision of the House, the committee's activities will indeed cease this week. I'm sure honourable members will want to join me in thanking the right honourable gentleman and his colleagues on the committee for their work as it uh, clearly, sadly, in his eyes draws to an end. It is important, of course, as the right honourable gentleman points out, for the effective functioning of select committees that ministers and officials respond constructively to reasonable requests for them to give evidence. I'm sure that ministers will have heard the points made by the right honourable member and that they will respond appropriately to future requests from any select committee examining the implications of the UK's trade and cooperation agreement with the EU and other aspects of the ongoing relationship between the UK and the EU, but I do appreciate that what I've been able to say uh, is of no comfort whatsoever to the right honourable gentleman. Thank you. Um, uh, I would normally have a short suspension of the House at this point, but having taken points of order, I observe that the personnel in the chamber have already changed and therefore we will waste no further time as we are certainly up against the clock on the next important debate. So we now come to the general debate on Global Britain and I call Secretary of State Liz Truss to move the motion. Secretary of State. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm delighted to open this debate on Global Britain when for the first time in 48 years we now have full control of our trade policy. Back in 1846, Richard Cobden inspired people in Manchester with his belief that free trade would be the greatest revolution that ever happened in the world's history, drawing men together, thrusting aside antagonism and uniting us in the bonds of eternal peace. That revolution continues today, as for the first time in nearly half a century, we are a sovereign trading nation free to pursue British interests whilst promoting British values. Our newly independent trade policy will create jobs, grow our slice of the global pie and unlock great swathes of the world to the best of Britain. As we recover from COVID-19, we need to think radically about how we generate economic growth and how we are going to use 